Okay, thank you. so thank you for the introduction and for the invitation to speak here. It's, um, it's a great pleasure. Um, so uh, I'll be speaking about uh, Hopf and Preli algebras in regularity structures. Um, and I, um, I put a link here to some lecture notes that I, uh, I apologize I didn't distribute beforehand, but I only finished them on the flight uh, here yesterday. So they're, um, uh, they're still actually under construction. So this is not the, uh, the, the final version, but I think the first three lectures or so are, are, are going to be there. So you can kind of, if you forget some notation or, or some terminology, then hopefully it'll be, it'll be in there. Um, uh, and then probably this number will also change because WordPress doesn't let you update files. You have to create a new one. So you can always just go to my homepage and navigate from there to find it. Um, okay, so, because um, uh, from what I understand, the, the audience is a bit diverse, so there's pro may, perhaps people who have never heard of regularity structures or, or stochastic partial differential equations. So I want to begin with a little bit of, of motivation and an explanation of the kind of um, uh, equations that, that we would like to solve and, uh, um, uh, and the issues that one runs into uh, while, while trying to solve them and potential ways that we, that we get around them. Um, and uh, I'm going to focus, uh, so as the, as the title suggests, I'm going to focus on the algebraic side of the theory. So I'm going to be a little bit, um, um, so I'm going to be a little bit um, uh, not so careful when I'm dealing with analytic aspects of things. So, so if I say something which isn't completely 100% true, like I forget some boundary data or things like this, don't, uh, please don't uh, uh, come at me with, with lynch forks and <laughs> um, I will, uh, um, uh, I just want to get the main idea across. So in fact, only the analytic aspects are only going to begin in this, uh, in this uh, kind of motivational bit at the beginning. Um, so, uh, so this is uh, basically SPDs and uh, power counting. Okay, so the kind of equation that we're interested in solving uh, throughout the whole, uh, all of the lectures will be parabolic equations of the following type. So in this equation, U is posed on say r plus times r d minus one. So we, we're on a d-dimensional um, uh, base space. It's, it's real valued and possibly a distribution. So it might not be a function. Here, Partial T minus L is a parabolic operator. So for example, partial T minus uh, the Laplacian, where the Laplacian acts on the, on the final uh, coordinate. Uh, so this is the heat operator, but you could also take the Laplacian squared uh, or, or kind of, there's a, quite a general um, can be quite a general uh, operator. And xi is uh, very similar rd into r. This is going to be um, a noise term. So what I mean by noise is, a, is essentially a random function or again, possibly a distribution. Okay, so for possibly a distribution. Okay, so this is going to be the essentially the equation that I'm always going to refer to. Uh, so actually, I also should say what f is. f is essentially a function. So f is a smooth function. Of the jet of u and psi. 
So it can depend on U, its derivatives, and also on the noise on its derivatives. So very common examples that perhaps people have already seen. So first example is an SD. And in this case, we're essentially looking at partial U is equal to F of U psi times psi. So there's no, uh, there's no operator L uh, and we're just on a one dimensional space. So this is, this is the case D is equal to one. So our framework allows for, for, for SDs. Um, another one is um, the phi for D minus one uh, equations, the uh, dynamical phi for D minus one equations. And this is given by partial T minus Laplacian, U is equal to minus U cubed plus, plus psi. And D is arbitrary here. So bigger than or equal to two. Okay, so the main issue when one tries to solve these equations in the regime that we're interested in is that, um, is the problem of uh, multiplying distributions. So, um, <clears throat> so typically what will happen is that uh, the noise will become uh, quite singular, so it'll be a distribution in most of the cases that we're interested in. So it'll be a, a function of, of negative reg regularity. Um, and this poses some problems when trying to solve uh, um, uh, when, 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 tr when trying to solve these equations. So uh, the solution itself will have an upper bound on its regularity, and then because of this, you uh, will have troubles in making sense of some of the, some of the products on the right-hand side of this, of this equation. So uh, to put a little bit more detail into, into this, um, let me recall the proposition. So let alpha and beta uh, be real indices and um, denote by C alpha RD the order best of spaces. So um, I'm not gonna actually give a definition of all the best of spaces. I, um, uh, we won't actually need the definition for, for the purposes of this course. Um, but uh, what will be important for us is to know how to multiply the uh, two, two elements in, in, in two different whole the best of spaces. So this proposition, so this proposition is sometimes called the Young's product theorem. It tells us when there's a deterministic way of multiplying um, a function f and a function g from different uh, from different best of spaces. So it tells us that the multiplication map. This is a function that takes f g to f g. Extends continuously. C alpha times C beta into C alpha minimum beta if and only if alpha plus beta is positive. Okay. So so this is um, this is quite a classical result in harmonic analysis, and it's a very useful tool when trying to solve uh, when trying to solve equations. So let's look at a little bit more detail this um, dynamical phi four model. So let's look at phi for d minus one for at d is equal to two, three, and four. So <clears throat> let's, uh, we're gonna use uh, in addition to this proposition, we're going to use two more facts about um, uh, about uh, the, um, the noise here. So I, I didn't actually mention here. So the noise, we're always going to take it to be, uh, so in these two equations, we take it as white noise. This is 
like noise on, on D. This is a this is a random distribution whose um, so formally speaking, its covariance is given by Dirac delta of x minus y. So okay, so of course, uh, if psi was a function, this this wouldn't make any sense because uh, um, you can't kind of is uh, not, not quite well defined, but you should you should think of this as a um, uh, as a way of prescribing the covariance when I test psi, uh, psi against the test function f, and then basically it's uh, um, the covariance of psi tested against f um, times psi tested against uh, the expectation of psi tested against f uh, and psi tested against uh, times psi tested against g is just the L two in a product of f and g. So this is the way uh, one interprets this. But I think this, this kind of makes it clear that you should think of psi as a normal random variable at every s space point x and y, which are completely decorrelated. Okay, so we're gonna use two facts about, about the, the white noise, um, as well as the parabolic operator. So <clears throat> there's, a, there's a Kolmogorov type regularity theorem concerning the regularity of the white noise. And this is that, uh, psi takes values in C minus D over two minus one half minus, uh, almost surely. So if you, uh, fix a realization of psi, almost surely it will belong to this uh, whole Lebesgue space. X, not minus one. Uh, and uh, uh, just a note of notation, when I write C alpha minus like this, I really mean C alpha minus kappa for Kappa positive, but small, so ar arbitrarily small. So I just think of this as a as a fixed small number, extremely close to, uh, extremely close to this index. So maybe think of kappa as one over a million or something. Uh, this will be fine. Okay. <clears throat> um, uh, the other piece of information that we need is is what happens with the um, with the parabolic operator. So when these whole Bessel spaces are defined correctly, and this actually, this regularity uh, theorem assumes that they are as well. So essentially uh, one has to define them using uh, parabolic scalings. Uh, but again, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll discuss that a little bit more actually later. Um, the inverse of the heat operator, it maps you from C alpha into C alpha plus two. So it, it gains you uh, two derivatives uh, under the under an appropriate scaling defined on these on, on these spaces. Rather, if the spaces are defined using appropriate scaling, so which is kind of natural because the Laplacian here has two derivatives. So the Laplacian is nine, perhaps eight. You should should make this explicit as well. So it's uh, it's an operator of this form. Uh, so it kind of it takes two derivatives of your function. And because uh, um, it's a it's of a coercive uh, type, um, uh, you uh, uh, you'll you'll gain two derivatives back. So um, uh, when you take its inverse, and uh, uh, likewise for time. Okay, so with these um, uh, with this piece of uh, uh, information, we can actually already see what to do in the case. So. In the case d is equal to two. In the case d is equal to two, then uh, looking at this equation, so I'll recall that this is the, um, um, we're looking at the five, four, one equation. 
uh, psi is going to be in C uh, minus three over two minus. Um, so this implies that if we, uh, if we look at the linear part of this equation, so there's a, there's a term here which is of regularity minus three over two minus. So when we uh, invert it with the, when we invert the heat operator, we expect U, say so expect U to be in C uh, one half minus. And so we see that we can actually probably solve for u as a genuine function. And so what this means is that, yeah, I didn't even need uh, this, uh, uh, this, this pro proposition here with young products. I can, I can obviously, if I have a uh, one half holder function, I can obviously take its cube. Um, u cubed is well defined. What this means is that I can actually set up a kind of, so formally what you would do on the analytic side is you would set up a fixed point, um, which takes this input to psi and then some boundary data that I've, I, I've, I've ignored for now, uh, and, uh, and gives you a contraction, at least over a sufficiently short time interval, uh, for uh, um, which maps you essentially to the heat operator, the inverse of the heat operator uh, can evolve through the right hand side. So essentially, uh, because this, this u cubed is a continuous function of the u, it turns out that this procedure gives you a contraction and you're able to solve the fixed point, at least for short times. Okay, so this is what we mean by solving the equation. So we can get a, a short time solution for this, um, for this PDE for almost, sure, uh, almost every realization of psi. So let me continue on. Uh, so let's see what happens in, in the higher dimensions. So now let's look at, uh, so consider now the case uh, D is equal to three. So, and we're still looking at the same 5-4 dynamical model. So now psi takes values in C uh, to the minus two minus. Um, and uh, so this implies that U is at best in uh, C, uh, C zero minus. We, we gain two derivatives. Um, but uh, but now what this means is that u cubed is Ill analytically ill-defined because uh, we see that we're essentially in this. So even to define the square, if we wanted to apply a proposition of this type, we would take alpha equal to uh, some number a little bit below zero, and same with beta, and uh, and we see that okay, there's the sum of those is obviously going to be negative. So this proposition is. Is, is useless in, in, in defining this in defining this cubed. Um, okay, and so so because the, the, the cubed can't be seen as a continuous function of the of the of the solution itself, this procedure that I described before of setting up a fixed point and trying to get a contraction, it's it's going to fail. And uh, at this point, you might actually wonder, well, uh, what's so special about hold the best of spaces? So, so maybe there's some other function space, or like a very carefully chosen subspace of, uh, of, of the best of spaces, such that I can actually set up the fixed point, as I said, described before. So I can maybe set up U to be, um, U to belong to that subspace, and then uh, you know, I can multiply arbitrary elements of that subspace together in a continuous way, uh, and then I can get my contraction. So it turns out that this is actually not, not the case. So as a remark, uh, 
this the singularity that u cubed can't be defined in an in in analytic way is not an artifact of of the C alpha spaces. So there's actually um, in the in the case uh, d is equal to one. So in the one dimensional case, um, uh, there's a um, which, uh, so it's a result even proven in the 90s by, by Lang, I think in 91, that um, uh, you, you basically can't find a linear Banach space which is able to handle stochastic differential equations. So, so for SDEs, a similar problem will appear. So as an, as an exercise, uh, try to use the fact that psi appears and um, psi has this regularity and then when you invert partial t, it, it again gives you two derivatives uh, um, because sort of time will count for, uh, count for two if, if you keep, um, keep the, the parabolic scaling. Uh, and, uh, and you'll see that this, the product between the psi and u is going to be ill-defined. So psi will have regularity a little bit below minus one and u will have regularity a little bit below one so f of u times psi. So f of u is going to have regularity also a little bit below my, uh, a little bit below one. So the product between psi and f of u is going to be ill-defined uh, by this proposition. And so, so this um, this, uh, this this result actually tells you that um, you you can't find a linear space uh, for which you can set up a fixed point for to, to, to solve for u. So you have to do something uh, something a little bit nonlinear. Okay, so this is uh, I think. Uh, an, an interesting remark. Okay, so let's go a little bit a little bit further into this. So, um, uh, so this is uh, going to call it the Prada de Bush method. And so this is for again for d is equal to three. Uh, so this is actually true for uh, the cube will always be ill-defined for uh, dimensions big three and, and larger. So um, uh, we can we can try to do something um, uh, a little bit different. So uh, the idea of the Prada and the Bush in order to build a, a kind of a, a robust solution theory for this uh, for the dynamical phi four model in dimension in dimension three was to basically consider. you single out the most irregular part of the equation, which is the noise. So you consider an auxiliary function, V, which solves this, just the linear part of the, of, of the equation with the, with the noise psi. And then you define U to be equal to V plus X. The hope is that X is a little bit better behaved. So then um, the equation that X solves is minus, um, okay, so I'm gonna expand the cube already. So this will be v squared x plus three dx squared plus x cubed. And, uh, <clears throat> and we see that um, uh, the idea here is that now, now there's no noise term. And this function v that we've constructed well, our Schrader estimates actually tell us that V is going to be an element of C zero minus. So it's much better behaved than the noise. We've gained two degrees of regularity on top of the noise. Uh, and so here we, we're essentially just trying to cube and square this function. And then hopefully we can set up a, our fixed point so that X, um, X is a sort of better behaved. So uh, indeed, what we can do is interpret v cubed and v squared as what follows. And uh, so for this, I'm going to recall another proposition. The proposition is that uh, let V epsilon be V convolved with uh, with delta epsilon, where delta epsilon is a mollifier. It's a it's a smooth approximation to the identity, such that 
So so when delta converges to, to delta converges to zero. And uh, then the, the, the statement of the proposition is that there exists constant C epsilon, which are deterministic, so they don't depend on the realization of, of, of V, which is a random distribution, um, such that V squared with these funny uh, sort of these two dots uh, between the between the, the with the colons between the two, uh, which is defined to be v squared minus c epsilon. This converges to a process v uh, with the two dots as epsilon goes to zero, and similar thing for the cube. Now we put a three C epsilon, uh, V epsilon, and here. Um, this converges to V, uh, v cubed root power. And this convergence happens in, in C uh, zero minus, and say in probability. <clears throat> okay, so the, the idea now is that, well, actually, perhaps these two singular terms, the v cubed and the v squared, they're just not the right thing to look at. Because we know that as, if, I, if I take a mollified approximation of my, of my driving noise, which essentially corresponds to taking a mollification of, my, of, uh, of, of v, um, these, uh, the v squared and the v cubed, they're not going to converge. So, uh, to uh, to justify why I say that they're not going to converge, I should add that C epsilon, this constant that you need to subtract from V squared to make it converge, it diverges to infinity as epsilon goes to zero. Essentially, this this constant is is the expectation of of uh, of V squared at any at some given point. Um, so this is called Wick renormalization. So hopefully that ties in with one of the other mini courses to some extent. Um, one quick slide. Okay, so um, so our, our idea now is to okay so so let's solve for instead x with the same equation but equal to v cubed plus two v squared x v plus three vx plus x cubed. So <clears throat> both of these processes, uh, v cubed and v squared, they're now in C zero minus. So this is much, uh, much better than the original equation that we were looking at because our shouter estimates, so our shouter estimates over there, imply that x should belong to C two minus uh, and uh, therefore, the products now v squared x and v x are well defined. And this is by this uh, Young's product theorem. Okay, so <clears throat> so indeed we can uh, so the same procedure that I described just before with the with setting up a, a fixed point inside C two minus this now actually works and for almost re every realization of uh, of v or equivalently of the noise uh, we can solve for x and then to get back to our original equation so back to our equation for the u what we do is we simply define so we define the solution u 
to be equal to v plus x. And uh, one might wonder, well, what does this definition actually really mean? Because okay, I've defined it through a limiting procedure. Does u actually, in any sort of sense, solve my original PDE that I wanted to that I wanted to uh, start off with? Uh, and uh, the unfortunate answer is 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 no. So this is the actual theorem of of the Prado de Bush that, or some version of the Prado de Bush that uh, uh, that I wanted to present. So. <clears throat> Let psi epsilon be psi uh, involved with, uh, with with the mollifier. Uh, then for the, the same constant C epsilon that appears in here, um, the solutions to the following equations to the, the mollified equations. Uh, these guys converge to u in, say, in c0 minus, and in probability. As I said, I'll be a little bit, I won't be too careful with probabilistic and analytic aspects. Okay, and of course, uh, to make the statement precise, you would need to say for what kind of boundary conditions are allowed, um, uh, actually, you also need to, at least for the, for, for the way that I've, uh, the most straightforward way to solve this, you would work on a, on a torus instead of RD, so you would work with periodic boundary conditions. So, but uh, again, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm ignoring these aspects. So, uh, so we see that actually the limiting process U, it can't really be written as a, um, as a solution to a PD anymore. What it's written as is a, is a limit of renormalized PDs. So these, these terms here, these extra terms that we had to add to our original equation, these are called counter terms. Uh, and we needed to insert them to, to, obtain, to obtain some sort of a convergence. Um, actually for, um, for five for three, because this, uh, this term is, uh, uh, goes to plus infinity and we're sort of like amplifying the, the right hand side actually without it it would just converge to a constant function zero which is not not super interesting um, so uh, so it's more to get to convergence so sometimes needed for genuine convergence in this case you just needed to get a convergence which is non-trivial okay so this was uh, this was the uh, the idea of an, of the Prado and the bush um, okay, so let's go up one more step. Let's look now at, at what happens with d is equal to four. So we're looking at five, four, three. So this time uh, the situation is, uh, is, a, is, is quite, a, quite, quite a lot more worse. So d is going to be a process inside c minus one half minus. So the, the, the noise remember is, is in now it's going to be in C minus five over two minus, according to our Kolmogorov type uh, regularity theorem. Um, and uh, when we, the way that one has to augment this proposition, so the proposition still remains true. The only difference is that the convergence for V squared happens in C minus one minus. So essentially double the, double the degree of negative regularity and V cubed analogously is going to belong to C minus three over two minus. It becomes tripled. So kind of the, the idea is that if you, if you take a random, say Gaussian distribution like this V uh, of, of a negative regularity, when you take its Wick powers, you add up all the regularities that, 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 that you saw before. This is, these are again, certainly not deterministic analytic facts. They, they happen because of probabilistic cancellation. So, so you need, so these are all stochastic calculus results, if you like. Okay, 
okay, but, but we, we can show that this is the case. And then what this implies is that the now the most singular term on the right hand side of for x is going to be, so if we, if we replace the v cubed and the v squared by these renormalized fourth powers, uh, we see the, um, the most uh, singular term is v cubed, which has regularity minus three over two. So x is going to be at best in, so x is at best in c one half minus. But then this implies that uh, products like v squared x are now ill-defined. Ill Actually, and so is so is v x squared. Both products are all defined. Okay, so, um, what uh, what we can try to do, and what's 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 quite natural, and it's going to I think lead us to an interesting conclusion, is that we can repeat and try to repeat the de Prado de Bush trick. So instead of solving for x, let's create an auxiliary function which, uh, which takes upon the most singular part of the, of the equation, so the, 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 the v cubed, um, and then define x as being that function plus, plus a remainder. So we define partial t w is equal to v cubed, and then we define x to be uh, v cubed plus the remainder y. And if we look at the at the equation that, that y solves, it's going to be of the following form. This definition implies that um, v minus three v squared times w plus y plus other terms. Yes, yes, sorry, sorry, yes, yes, sorry, yeah, of course, yes, thanks. <laughs> yes. W plus y, yeah, okay. Um, okay. Um, thank you. Um, <clears throat> okay, so then if we do the same power counting as we did before, Okay, so at this point we see that there's another singular, uh, singular term. So if we expand out the bracket, we're gonna see a v squared times a w. So w, according to this definition, so w gains two degrees of regularity above, um, above c uh, minus three over two. So this is, uh, so w is now in c um, one half minus. So what we need to do is make sense of, or, or let, me, let me just say, we can make sense of the v squared times v, uh, times w. Uh, oh, and I'll, I'll stop writing the, the wick powers because they're a bit difficult to write. <laughs> um, so, these two, uh, these two guys, they're a, um, they're a multilinear function of the noise. So ex explicitly, um, the V squared is, is the heat kernel convolved with the noise. So V is the heat kernel convolved with the noise and W is uh, the heat kernel convolved with the, with the cube of, uh, of, of V. So this is some explicit multilinear function of the, of, of, of the noise. And it turns out that we can indeed make sense of this guy Again, using stochastic analytic method, so so not not deterministically, but but stochastically, and this object is going to live in uh, well, you can kind of guess where it's going to live. So W is a distribution of regularity uh, one half, and V is a is a distribution of regularity minus one. And so here, um, <coughs> the idea that when we multiply uh, when we uh, multiply two random distributions together and we add up the regularities. This doesn't hold anymore because one of the functions is of positive regularity. So you can't you can't expect to multiply a distribution of some negative regularity by a slightly well, by a function with some positive regularity and kind of improve the the, the regularity of uh, 
of the, of the, of the bad distribution. So this, is going to, uh, this product is going to inherit the worst regularity of the two terms, which is C minus one minus. You can see I've lectured online for far too long. <laughs> So what this implies, so following on from our conclusion over there, uh, is that, okay, we can make sense of the V squared times W term, uh, but then uh, Y is going to inherit, so Y is going to get two degrees of, of regularity better about that. That term is going to appear as a linear source term in the, in the equation. So Y is going to be of regularity at best one minus, so two, two, uh, two derivatives better. And then, um, uh, but then the, the product, which is uh, V squared times Y, uh, this is going to be now ill-defined. So, so the V squared, um, uh, remember it's a, of, of regularity, um, uh, minus one minus, so the, re the sums of the regularity is a little bit below zero, so we're just outside of the scope of, of, the, of the Young's product theorem, but, but, but actually only just. Um, <clears throat> okay, so then uh, we repeated the tr this trick once, so I just want to convince you now that actually repeating this to Prada de Bush method doesn't help. So we gain something from going to x to y, but it actually stops from there. So, uh, so this is because, so if we define, okay, so let's define one more guy, which is now, so I've run out of uh, letters at the end of the alphabet, so let me circulate back to the beginning. So if we define uh, uh, a to be like this, and then we define y to be equal to a plus z, then we see that the equation for z takes on a very similar form. So it's going to be minus three, minus three v squared a plus z plus other terms. We see again that this, so this term in here This term here, even if we can make sense of it, the, the v squared times the a, it's going to again inherit the worst regularity of the of the two of them, which is v squared. This is in c uh, c minus one minus, and then this implies that because it again appears as a linear source term in in, in, uh, for the, in the PDE for z, this means that z is going to be of regularity at most uh, z, z uh, minus one. 
Uh, and this again renders the, the term b squared times z uh, uh, ill-posed. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this, this type of uh, formal power counting, at least, uh, demonstrates that we're gonna have essentially zero hope of trying to set up uh, a space in which we can solve for any kind of remainder like this, which was different from the, the product Bush method. So in, in dimension, uh, dimension b is equal to three, because we, we could set up a linear space uh, for which we could solve for x. Um, okay. Um, so, uh, so let me make a, a remark at this stage. This is probably, this, there's a, I'll just probably end the, the hand waving right at the, at the end of the lecture. Um, So if, uh, if the product between b squared and w it actually did inherit the sum of their regularities, so v squared was on minus one minus, and w was on one half minus. So if this product could have, made, could have been, uh, if we could make sense of v squared w inside c one half minus, uh, minus one half minus, uh, then we'd be in much better shape, and we're okay. We're okay because uh, in this case, y would have been in, um, uh, so wh where did I say, it? okay, yeah, here. So y would have been in, so if this was, if this was the case, So if, if this was the case, then y would have been in three over two minus, and um, and this product, so v w it was in c minus one minus, y is in c uh, three over two minus. So this pr product is is perfectly well well defined, and the same applies for for the other singular products that I didn't write out in in, in the y equation. Um, so uh, this kind of um, this kind of hope that we could have made sense of v squared uh, times w inside c minus uh, uh, c minus minus one half minus uh, roughly corresponds to multiplication behaving like uh, uh, c alpha times c beta being into c alpha plus beta. So it roughly corresponds to multiplication behaving like that. So multiplication certainly doesn't behave like this, uh, but what we can what we can look at is instead of looking at uh, v squared and w uh, by itself, we can recall that w is a is a holy continuous function. So instead of w, let's look at w x, a collection of functions, where w x is given by w minus w x. So around every single point, we recenter W. Then one can actually show that then show that uh, V squared uh, times W X for every given X uh, behaves Again, after after certain a certain renormalization, so this is again a stochastic uh, a stochastic analytic argument, uh, behaves like it were in in c minus one half minus uh, locally around x. And this roughly corresponds to the fact that, so the kind of the, the obvious fact that if, um, if f is a function such that f of y is bounded less than or equal to say a times y minus x, and g is a function such that g of y is less than or equal to b times the alpha b times x minus y to the, to the beta, then this implies that f of y times g of y 
is less than or equal to a b times x minus y. Now here you you do add up the exponents alpha plus beta. Cool. So this is a rather uh, it's an obvious uh, it's an obvious uh, it's an obvious fact. So. Um, So this idea actually can, can take us uh, quite far. So the idea is now, the idea is basically express y locally around every point as linear, well as a, um, let me just say in terms of the, these kind of recentered stochastic objects, so v squared w x, and then kind of the other stochastic objects that appear inside the, inside the equation, and then uh, plus plus something which is smaller, smaller at x, so something that vanishes quicker than all of the other guys uh, around x. So it might be of the same regularity actually, but it, it'll it'll actually be, it'll uh, locally around x, it'll behave uh, as a, like a much better function. Uh, and then we can actually, so, and then after this, all products should make sense. So maybe by, by applying some local version of Young's uh, product theorem. Okay, so this was, okay, this was incredibly hand wavy. Um, um, but uh, I think one of the, one of the um, achievements of, uh, maybe I'll get here, so one of the achievements or, or goals of regularity structures, at least uh, one, of the, um, one of the ways of seeing it, is that um, uh, regularity structures help, help to make this, uh, Basically, makes this precise or rigorous. So you can actually make this idea of expressing functions locally around points x uh, quite uh, quite well defined. Okay, so then uh, I want to kind of maybe end. Uh, the lecture with a brief summary of what I might cover in the next uh, in the next few uh, few lectures. I will hopefully cover. Right. So. Um, So, so actually, maybe before that, l let me finally stay, state an actual theorem concerning, so this is now due to uh, iron and protein. So just to conclude this, this discussion about phi four. Um, so in, uh, in when d is equal to four, uh, essentially the same theorem as the theorem of de Prater and de Bush holds. So uh, you almost have the same statement verbatim. So the, the point is that now there exists a cons sequence of constants C bar epsilon, um, which also diverge to infinity as epsilon goes through C. Uh, oh, so let me not worry about uh, the divergence at this stage. Um, such that uh, the solutions to this, these PDEs Minus u epsilon cubed uh, plus c bar epsilon u uh, plus psi epsilon. These converge. Uh, these converge.
converge to a, to a random process U. And this convergence happens in C minus one half, uh, uh, C minus one half minus. So uh, virtually the, the same analogous statement as, uh, as for the, um, uh, the three-dimensional case, except the proof is, is, is substantially different. So, <clears throat> um, so I, uh, I want to discuss, so in the next three lectures, then I want to discuss various aspects of this kind of uh, picture that I, uh, that, that I try to, to draw. So, um, so in the first one, um, I'm going to discuss uh, positive renormalization. And this roughly corresponds to taking, um, making these recentering procedures. So W goes to Wx, V squared, W goes to V squared, Wx, and then so on and so forth. It's these kind of, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the algebra behind uh, subtracting off these, uh, these uh, Taylor jets. Uh, so this will be roughly approximately lecture one, or well, lecture, lecture two, maybe with a spillover into lecture three. Then uh, I'll discuss uh, uh, negative normalization. I'll, I'll try to maybe explain why they're called positive and negative uh, at that time, uh, which co corresponds approximately to taking V squared to, the, to its wick power, and then analogously V squared W, we would need to renormalize the whole thing. So V, this thing goes to V squared W. This. We need to uh, subtract off certain, um, a certain counter terms to make this convergence happen. Um, and then finally, I'll discuss um, normalization of, uh, of SPDs. And this roughly corresponds to finding these C epsilon bars. So, so find what these, uh, it's the whole counter term actually, not just the constant. So they show that they always exist and uh, give, a, give an algebraic mechanism for how to actually compute them. So for, um, for the five uh, dimension uh, is equal to three, for example, it was, uh, it's a relatively straightforward way uh, from, this, from this proposition that you can see that this um, the constant appearing here, three times C epsilon, has to be this constant over here that, that appears here. So this is a kind of a, uh, you can get to it by, through a few algebraic manipulations. Um, the fact that there exists an analogous constant here is, uh, is less clear. And actually its expression is going to be uh, quite a bit more involved. Um, so, uh, so yes, I'll, I'll, I'll try to present the algebraic structures that appear behind these, uh, these procedures. Thank you. Have an intuitive interpretation why you're going to do uh, the powers uh, regularized as necessary, for instance, everything. Do you have a, an intuitive interpretation or an understanding of why uh, going to the powers um, improves uh, the regularity of solutions? Um, so, like, for example, how we took the work power of V, v cubed V squared, and we got something which actually converges in some sense. And uh, so, uh, so you can view this from a, from kind of the lens of perturbation theory. Um, and uh, when one does this, these uh, the equations that we're interested in, so this phi four equation in dimension um, d is equal to two, three, and four. It's a super normalizable theory. 
So if you effectively, if you put a little, uh, okay, so I don't have a, a good, um, a good perhaps intuition for why it's precisely WIC powers, except for the fact that WIC powers behave very nicely with Gaussian processes, why it's not some other form of renormalization. Um, but, uh, but the reason that we can ultimately are, are able to solve these, these equations is because uh, effectively if you put a little um, small power in front, of the, in front of the noise that scales appropriately with um, uh, when you hit it with the, with the heat, heat kernel, uh, you're effectively only going to see a finite number of kind of negative powers of epsilon. So there's only going to be a finite number of, of objects that are uh, in some sense of, uh, of negative regularity. So, so this is the, uh, the reason why, why, why this works. Um, but yes, why, why it's precisely, I mean, in some sense, you didn't actually need WIC powers in order to, uh, to set up this proposition. I could have actually uh, tweaked these constants, at least one of the constants, C epsilon, by some finite shift, actually. And same with, uh, and I could have done a, a, something quite something similar with this with this heat cube. So I didn't necessarily need to work precisely with uh, these constants, C epsilon. They're not unique. I could have worked with uh, with finite shifts of these constants, and I would have obtained a slightly different renormalized uh, renormalized PD. It's I mean it's just that. Uh, uh, nature is quite good, and WIC powers do indeed converge. So, <laughs> apart from that, I unfortunately don't have a good uh, explanation. <laughs> yes. This is a partial answer to my question. Uh, it, it smells very much like in quantum field theory renormalization. And, yes. and, and there is a distinction between super renormalized non renormalizer and renormalizer. And how far can you push uh, the method to the renormalizable phase? I mean, the borderline, which can be treated by RG methods, for instance. If it goes up so much, as we yeah. are. So that's a, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, so this, this method, uh, as it's currently set up, uh, so this method with, with regularity structures, um, uh, which involves this kind of algebraic side and some of the analytic side that I think Lorenzo will speak about later, uh, it's quite restricted to the super renormalizable methods. But you can really push it all the way up to up to the borderline case. So you can actually consider, you can effectively consider the this 5-4 equation, which I, I think I've, I've rubbed up now, but you can consider it in fractional dimensions. So you consider it, so five, d is equal to five is really the renormalizable case. This is when this argument that you have a finite number of negative, negative trees uh, breaks down. At dimension five, you have an infinite number of them. But in, in kind of bigger dimensions, or smaller dimensions, you always have a finite number. It, it grows very quickly as, as you approach dimension five. Uh, and you can actually really rigorously set up uh, this, this equation in this fractional dimension, so for example, by considering a fractional power of the Laplacian or a slight multiplication of the noise, uh, and you can really solve it all the way up to dimension five, but not, not dimension five. 